Um, I've been working on questions of relativity and universality of human rights for, I'm afraid to admit, more than 30 years. Um, actually, the first thing I published on the topic was in 1982. A very frightening thought at the moment. Um, and it's one of those perennial topics in the study of human rights. And I think that after working on it for more than a quarter century, I finally, a few years ago, began to get it right. And so that's what I'm going to try and do, is sort of outline an account of how to think about the universality and relativity of human rights. And I'm going to try and make three main points. All right. First, universality and relativity are usually presented as polar opposites. The issue is either whether human rights are relative or universal, or the extent to which they are relative and universal. Any kind of dichotomy can be transformed into a, ten, into a continuum, and then you just place things in terms of these two polar opposites. What I want to suggest to you is that this is fundamentally the wrong way to think about human rights, or actually about the universality of most things. Right? Um, as we'll see in a moment, universality is fully compatible with considerable relativity. And then the issue becomes not whether something like human rights is relative or universal, but how it's universal and how it's not, and how it's relative and how it is not. Right? So that's the first point I'm going to make. Second point is I'm going to argue that there are three very, very important senses in which we can talk about human rights being universal in the contemporary world. But there are also important senses in which they are not universal, and I'll talk about those a little bit more briefly. If I had 45 minutes, we could do more on that. And third, I want to suggest that in discussing the universality of human rights, which are usually formulated at a very high level of generality, we need to think about three kinds of levels in which there are differing degrees of universality and relativity. So that's where we're going to go. Um, and we're going to start, though, with definitions. Because one of the things that I finally figured out um, is that a lot of what happens in these debates is that people have different senses of universal and relative in mind, and they don't clarify them in a way that allows the discussion to go forward productively. So let's start with the dictionary. Dictionaries have their problems, but they're a good place to start sometimes if you want to know what things mean. And when we start with the dictionary, at least when I start with the dictionary, I always start with the Oxford English Dictionary. And its first definition of universal is the following extending over, comprehending, or including the whole of something. Extending over, comprehending, or including the whole of something. Now, the first thing to notice immediately here is that universal, in this sense, is relative to a particular class or group, the something over which it extends. And in fact, this is the most common sense of the term. Universal in this most basic sense means applies across all of a particular domain. So that we talk about universal health care, universal primary education, and universal suffrage, all right, which mean making health care, primary education, and voting rights available to all citizens or nationals or residents of a country not everyone, everywhere. All right. Now, there is a second sense of universal, as the Oxford English Dictionary puts it, of or pertaining to the universe in general, or all things in it, existing or occurring everywhere, or in all things. All right. Now, notice that in this sense of applying everywhere in the universe, very few things are actually universal, other than uh, conclusions of logic, like mathematics, 
or maybe some of the laws of physics, or perhaps the laws of God. Right? Therefore, the Oxford English Dictionary immediately goes on to indicate that this sense is, quote, chiefly poetic or rhetorical, to which I think we can add philosophical or theological. In other words, the applying everywhere in the universe sense of universality is not the principal sense of the term. Now, clearly, human rights don't apply everywhere in the universe. They haven't even applied throughout all of history, um, as we can talk about more later um, if we have a little bit of time for discussion. However, there are at least three important senses in the applying across a whole class sense that we can talk about human rights today being fundamentally universal. All right? First, if we think about the domain of international law and politics. Right? What we find is that there is an extensive body of international human rights law that is unusually widely endorsed. For example, sorry, there are the six principal international human rights treaties, the two 1966 international human rights covenants, and the separate treaties on racial discrimination, discrimination against women, torture, and the rights of the child, have on average 88% ratification rates. All right? the, in other words, some between 150 and 193 out of a possible 195 states uh, have ratified these various treaties with an average ratification rate of 88%. What this means is that in a very real sense, there is an international legal and political universality. That there is a single agreed upon meaning for human rights in contemporary international law and politics. This is what I call international legal universality, right? Within the class of international law and politics, human rights are universal. What happens if we let you just walk? <laughs> he started walking last week, so Aww. he's gotten uh, really quite excited about this. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. All right, now, second sense of universal that I think we can talk about is what is usually called overlapping consensus universality. And this relies on an idea that John Rawls, the American political philosopher, developed. Rawls distinguishes between what he calls comprehensive doctrines, that is, overarching foundational philosophical, religious, or ideological perspectives or worldviews, and what he calls political conceptions of justice, which are narrower constitutional accounts of the basic elements of political legitimacy, specified largely without reference to any particular comprehensive doctrine. Now the interesting point here, other than this guy, um, <laughs> is that proponents of very different comprehensive doctrines, in fact of irreconcilable comprehensive doctrines, may reach an overlapping consensus on a political conception of justice. We see this all the time in American politics. George Bush and I agree on almost nothing, and both of us hope that the class uh, of what we agree on is probably zero, uh, when it comes to foundational philosophical doctrines. And yet, you know, uh, despite all the bad things I might have to say about our former president, Right, when it came to basic issues of rights, principles of legitimacy, the primacy of the Constitution, that in other words, a political conception of justice, there was relatively minor disagreement. This is characteristic of all modern liberal democratic societies, and I want to suggest that exactly the same thing has happened with human rights over the last several decades. Right? That people from very, very different political perspectives, different philosophical perspectives, 
different cultural perspectives, different regions of the world, all for their own particular reasons, have come to converge on human rights as a universal standard of political legitimacy in the contemporary world. More and more proponents of more and more comprehensive doctrines, Christians, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, atheists, utilitarians, Kantians, all right, liberals, conservatives, from all different perspectives, what we see is a convergence on the idea of universal human rights as they are specified in the body of international human rights law. That for all of the disagreements that exist in the world today, there really is something like this overlapping consensus on internationally recognized human rights. Now notice that the consensus is overlapping, not complete. All right, we draw the set diagrams, right? And uh, you see uh, that there is a lot of area of disagreement. And it's consensus on a political conception of justice. That is a constitutional structure for society. And that's what human rights basically provide, a constitutional structure. It's not a consensus on the foundations. It's a consensus on this political conception. And what this means is that although human rights have no single foundation, they have a set of multiple overlapping and, and really reinforcing foundations that makes this consensus much more powerful. If we needed everybody to agree at the level of basic philosophical or religious doctrines, we'd be in trouble. But we don't. That's not what human rights are. They're not a basic philosophical or religious doctrine. They're a set of political practices that in the contemporary world have been endorsed by essentially all leading comprehensive doctrines. There are huge literatures, for example, on Islam and human rights um, and on a variety of other topics, right? Um, utilitarians who used to be opposed to human rights. Uh, 50 years ago, there were almost no utilitarians who supported human rights. Today, most do. Um, Neo-Thomists, right? Catholic social teaching, used to ignore human rights all right, since Vatican II. It has come to be concerned with human rights. And we go this over and over in all parts of the world. In other words, the international legal consensus has an underlying theoretical consensus, a level of political theory, um, this overlapping consensus. Right, third type of universality that I want to talk about helps to explain both of these earlier sorts of universality. Why is it that different regions of the world, different cultural groups, different historical, uh, people with different historical experiences, people from very different religious backgrounds, all have come to converge on this idea of human rights as a fundamental standard of political legitimacy? I want to argue that the basis for this is the transformation of the modern world. It's created by states and markets. That modern states and modern markets provide, provide, provide um, pose certain kinds of standard threats to individuals, families, and communities. If, they, if you look at the history of the West, or if you look at the history of colonization um, and the penetration of the West into the non-Western world, what we see is that markets and states, which are really the economic and political features of modernity, have transformed societies across the globe in roughly the same kind of way posing the same kinds of threats 
from centralized bureaucratic intrusive states and from capitalist markets, which have a number of virtues, but also have a number of characteristic problems that they pose for individuals, families, and communities. Human rights are universal in the sense that they are the best set of practices that we've yet been able to develop to protect people from the standard threats to their dignity that are posed by modern markets and modern states. And modern markets and modern states have penetrated essentially the whole of the globe. There are small, isolated pockets of indigenous communities that have not been penetrated by markets and states, and therefore my argument does not necessarily apply there. But in 99% of the world, what we have are societies and polities and economies that take a modern form in which the dominant institutions politically are states, the dominant institutions economically are capitalist markets, and these require human rights. We can think about human rights as a way to humanize capitalist markets and as a way to civilize bureaucratic states. So that these three kinds of universality all interact and reinforce one another. Why is it that there's, a, there's an overlapping consensus? Because people across the world face the same problems. And human rights turn out to be the best set of solutions we've yet been able to devise for those problems. Given that people across the world face these common threats and have responded to them in similar kinds of ways, it's not surprising that we have the high level of ratification in international law and politics, and thus we have a real set of international human rights standards. So what we have then is human rights that are universal in some very fundamental senses for us. All right? But now notice that this universality is historically specific. All right? There's no claim that human rights apply everywhere and at all times. And there's no claim that all societies throughout history or all major cultural groups have in fact had ideas and practices of human rights. Quite the contrary, they haven't. All right, if we think about, just think about the West. The idea of human rights is completely foreign to the ancient and medieval worlds in which distinctions like Greek and barbarian, or Christian and heathen, identify a small group of human beings as truly human, and most of what we would today call humanity as savage, barbarian, or animal-like, and certainly not entitled to the same rights as civilized Christians or Greeks. And we can extend that further and, and run the argument. I think it's fairly obvious. In other words, human rights are historically relative. But for us today, universal. Notice also that we're only talking about universality of possession. The claim is only that everyone in the contemporary world has the same equal and inalienable human rights. We are not claiming that everyone enjoys those rights. <laughs> All right, we seem not to be enjoying ourselves right now. All right. We're not claiming that everyone is able to enjoy those rights. Right? And that's partly because we have a system of national implementation of internationally recognized human rights. 
there's agreement on the norms, but those rights are implemented almost exclusively by sovereign territorial states. And as a result of that, people in different places have very, very different levels of enjoyment of their human rights. Let's see if we're hungry. Want some cheese? Let's see if cheese suits the savage beast. Right. Want some cheese, buddy? Want some cheese? Slobber that all around. Want a piece? <laughs> no, you just want attention. You just want attention. You just want to be the center of attention. That's fine. Yep, we go through this uh, most afternoons when I have him. Um, I pick up the computer and he freaks out. <laughs> so, all right, so what we've got then is a sense in which it's very important to recognize the relativity or particularity of human rights. They respond to particular kinds of threats at a particular historical juncture. Right? And, but they are historically specific, but for us now, essentially universal. All right. Um, watch off. All right. So I've gone. All right. I can talk more, or I can stop now, and we can do some questions. Good, so am I. Uh, so start. Um, so listening to what you're saying, um, what's your answer to philosophers, what, whoever might be saying, that really um, human rights are more of like, come from like the cosmopolitan view, that, there's this, that they're based in morality and not necessarily based in markets and states? Right. Um, question is, what kind of a claim that is? Yeah. Is that a claim of the best way to justify them? Or is that a claim about how they, in fact, came to arise and the functions that they provide in the contemporary world? All right. So I'm not interested in a philosophically best justification. What I'm interested in is providing an explanation of the rise and development of the practice of human rights. And I'm interested in showing that this practice serves certain kinds of functions that are important across the globe in the contemporary world. Now, I mean, so somebody like Tom Pogge, for example, all right, I assume that might be who you have in mind um, in terms of a cosmopolitan justification for human rights. Interesting justification. Convinces him, doesn't convince me. All right, um, you know, there are some, some really fascinating work being done in very, very conservative Christian churches uh, about human rights. All right, shocking in some ways, all right? But what they've done is they've gone back to biblical texts, reread them in ways that now lead many um, extremely conservative American Christian churches to be very active in various human rights movements, all right? There's all kinds of different justifications. What I want to say is it's important that there be justifications. But it's absolutely not important that there be one justification. And in fact, part of the strength of human rights is precisely that it has multiple foundations. In other words, we're not asking people to change their culture. We're not asking people, how did we get that all down there? Very good. <laughs> we're not asking people to change their religion. We're not asking people to change anything other than some basic political practices, all right? Um, and that's important so that contemporary Muslims can justify human rights through reference to their holy text to the extent that they wish to do that, all right? Contemporary Hindus, I mean, think about Hinduism. I mean, could there be a less conducive philosophy all right, in which the very category human doesn't count. 
right? In which in the order of creation, some animals are higher than most members of the species Homo sapiens. And yet Gandhi turns it into a doctrine that supports human rights. Yeah. So if you happen to think that some kind of cosmopolitan, essentially rationalist, Kantian Rawlsian kind of account of human rights is the best justification. That's great because it makes human rights then relevant to you in a particular way that gives them extra power. All right? But the idea that there has to be one justification seems to me deeply misguided. That in fact, human rights, because they are not foundational philosophical or religious principles, but their legal and political practices, right? we should not expect that there be one justification. In fact, we should celebrate the fact that there are multiple kinds of justifications. Right? And leave it up to philosophers and theologians and individuals to grapple with the best justification. And this matters, right? Because different kinds of foundational justifications will put a different kind of twist, give different emphases to particular rights, all right? And that opens up a domain of particularity in implementation that I think is quite attractive, all right? We allow um, the part that I was going, that I didn't do. Basically, says, look, there's there's agreement at very broad levels, like. Everyone has a right to life, liberty, and security of person. But cashing that out is going to be done differently in different times and different places, in part on the basis of politics, in part on the basis of history, in part on the basis of level of development, and in part on the basis of philosophical and religious doctrines. We've got a situation where, where what we in effect have is the best of both possible worlds. All right, human rights can be... What is that? What is that? What is that? Shall we sit you down so that they can look at you again? And... <laughs> All right. Um, the best of both possible human rights can be justified uh, in ways that make sense to different people. And yet, this idea that there are universal rights can be maintained. All right, and so that's the kind of balance that I think accurately describes what's happening in the world and accurately describes what ought to be happening in the world. That we insist on certain universal standards at a very high level of generality that are then applied in particular kinds of ways and justified in particular kinds of ways. I wonder what situations in which you can say something sort of you know, this general right to life or something general and then there are, by our standards, some sort of violation and somebody in another country might say, well, this is our culture. I mean, I've heard the, the saying, you know, it's criminal, not cultural. And so at what point, does, where does that line There's, fall? There is no clear line. Look, um, there are things that are clearly an implausible interpretation of the right to life or the right to protection against torture or the right to social security or whatever it may happen to be. There are things that are clearly plausible interpretations, and there are some that lie in the middle. Right? Um, and I think that we've got sort of two things going on here. First, we have to, spe we have to determine what kind of a disagreement is it. So some of the stuff that uh, the propaganda apparatus of uh, North Korea comes up with, it's just completely implausible, right? Not worth taking seriously. On the other hand, um, one example that I uh, use a lot is the issue of apostasy among Muslims. All right? The Universal Declaration recognizes the right of everyone to change their religion. Most standard interpretations of Islam do not allow Muslims to change their religion. All right? How do we deal with that? I think that's an area in which there's a lot of gray area that needs to be worked out carefully. What I would emphasize, though, there is that, first of all, there's no disagreement about the fundamental right to freedom of religion. 
just as important in Islamic traditions as in Christian traditions. And so what we've got is a second order disagreement about a small part of a broad right in which there is a strong cultural and religious reason for making the argument and that needs to then be taken seriously. The way I handle that is to say that what we should look at is the way in which the prohibition of apostasy is enforced. So when Iran executes Baha'is, because in their view these are apostate Muslims, that's clearly unacceptable. On the other hand, if there, if for example, um, there are, there's considerable social discrimination against Baha'is. It's not problematic. The state doesn't deal with that. If, in fact, uh, the state provides religious uh, financial assistance to all churches, uh, all mosques, but not to Baha'i centers, that's fine too. In other words, there's no problem with different practices until they start to become coercive. And the more coercive those practices become, the more problematic they, they become. But there's no general answer. You've got to sit down with the particular case and sort of ask, where does it come from? So slavery, for example, is much easier to deal with. All right, yes, slavery is well established all right, in Islamic holy works. All right, the prophet himself had slaves, all right? And yet, virtually all Muslims today agree that slavery is unacceptable. And there's no problem um, for either Muslims or non-Muslims to say, look, that's just wrong, that's unacceptable, and can't do it. All right. Now, does that mean we have a right to invade countries that, that practice slavery? Of course not. Right? There are all kinds of other considerations going on here. But you've got to look case by case, ask what's going on, ask how fundamental it is, ask how much it's tied to other things that are either good or bad, and make difficult judgments. And I think that most of the interesting questions of relativity are about making these complex judgments in particular cases on the ground. Right? Um, and these broad sort of orienting frameworks that I've laid out are a useful background, but they're no excuse for working through cases. To what extent can, like, from the outside, can we, not impose, but perhaps, like, instill, like, the apostasy thing? Like, how much can, from the outside, can you influence that? Or is it something that has to change from within the society, within the culture itself? Um, one of my favorite non-response responses is that's an empirical question, not a theoretical question. All right, um, all right um, particularly when I teach international relations theory, they get sick and tired of me uh, coming up with that. All right, um, I think the answer is it depends. All right, um, clearly, there have to be internal processes. But usually, there are possibilities for influencing those internal processes. But notice that you can make things worse as well as make things better by how you intervene. All right? um, in other words, the ultimate question is, are there transformations taking place within the society in question? What can be done to support those forces that support those transformations? And what's the best way of supporting them? I think what we do, for example, in civil society support programs, all right, is very much grappling with these kinds of questions. How do we support progressive forces within a society? How do we provide assistance to those who happen to agree with us without harming their cause? All right, and again, this is a matter of particular cases worked out in particular ways. But clearly there are possibilities all right, in all but the most closed societies. You know, um, for constructive action for one of these terms. Last one it looks like since we've gotten people wandering in. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> you, you mentioned um, that the, the ratification for you know, these um, 
international documents is around 88%. Mm -hmm. Do you find that there is some sort of universality in the justifications for those who reject um, implementing such uh, laws? Okay, that's a really good point. And what I want to emphasize is that non-ratifications are not systematic. In other words, it's not that members of some cultural group, some regional grouping, Asian regional grouping is a little bit lower um, on average than other groups, um, regimes of a particular political type, right? They are largely individual idiosyncratic decisions, all right? And that's part of the more detailed argument for this being a deep kind of consensus. If there were big differences across regions or across cultural groups, then we might be less uh, likely to talk about a strong consensus. All right? But given that it's 88%, all right, there's not going to be much difference. Uh, difference. But even when it was down in, in the 60s or 70s, you could make the argument that there was no systematic variation. And therefore, it was just a matter of individual political decisions. And that's really important. So that if there were, you know, if, if Muslim states, for example, all right, systematically did not ratify uh, these documents, that would be a problem. All right, um, but that's not the case. Um, it, there are lots of individual political reasons why. As in the U.S., right, we're not party to uh, many of them, right? Um, Convention on the Rights of the Child has 193 out of 195 parties. The two are Somalia and <laughs> Go USA, right? Okay, um, so um, I think that that's really what it is. Um, and and that's, that's important. Um, that it's important that there not be big systematic holdouts anywhere. Which is, I think, then why it's important that we continue, as, as, as we've pretty much well done, to draw a sharp distinction between Islam and Islamists. All right, in the same way that we draw a sharp distinction between Christianity and lunatic right-wing Christians who are running first or second or third um, in the polls. All right, um, all right, um, all right um, so that's it. All right, I think we probably better stop, right, Sam? Uh, yeah, you got about two minutes. Two minutes. Time for one more, or you can get yourself out of here. <laughs> All right, um, I hope you've had fun. Um, you know, we, we try to bring you out here because um, even when there's snow instead of this nice weather, um, it's a good place to be. Um, <laughs> and hopefully uh, you've had a great time.